so what happened was I just got too busy with, uh, I was finishing up this grain character tutorial. So I'm posting this, I'm gonna be posting that pretty soon. Oh my God, CG, <laughs> CG Rockstar, thank you for the raid. I hope you had a good stream. Thank you for pointing out the pure ref to me. I've been using that and going, getting pretty, uh, pretty happy with that. That's terrifying. <laughs> so, yeah, with the I, <laughs> I was working on the Einstein one. Um, we did it last week, and then uh, what happened was, yeah, I just got busy finishing up this tutorial. Um, so I'll be posting. I, I put the a link to just the private kind of first draft of this tutorial in the Discord. If anyone has time, it's like hour hour and a half long or something like that. I just want to see if there's any bugs or kinks or stuff like that to to work out. Um, but I'll be posting it to, it's just a breakdown of how to render this using Redshift, going through the instancing process, uh, just making some different grain instance shape, kind of like the Pixar workflow, and uh, then doing some a few different shaders for it and stuff like that. So yeah, we're gonna be doing um, kind of cool zone, just exploration, Instagram type stuff or whatever. Uh, I was thinking today doing something that's like some kind of underground cave, the the Hulai uh, underground stuff had me a little jealous. I wanted to, to make some some stuff kind of like this. Um, so I'm, a, I don't know, just playing around with some kind of uh, terrain type of noises, lighting, um, maybe some some mineral or crystal type of formations or something like that. Um, but yeah, that's that's what my rough plan is for today. You seen the car burnout thing? Yeah, I'm I'm still working on it. Um, that's going to be so. The other thing I was doing. Um, is this, uh, the other thing, the voxel size. Yeah. So the GPU I'm using is a pretty high, uh, memory count, but, um, you might need to turn it down just to get it, uh, working on your, uh, graphics card with OpenCL or switch to CPU, but CPU is probably going to be too slow to even bother if you wanted to you might be able to like swap it out with the sparse solver and see what happens um if you're doing cpu based sims it's probably better to go with the sparse solver but yeah you could probably just turn the, the voxel size um bigger and get it a little bit uh looking a little bit better yeah so this is my updated i'm, I'm i don't know how much how much i'm going to keep using this format i might do a, a few different designs or something like that but um, this is gonna be the schedule for today. We're in the cool zone, doing this abstract ideation uh, look dev type stuff. August 9th. Yeah, so that's, um, I don't know if you've ever seen people do things like that, but basically you're gonna be doing Bex and modifying the packed transform of, um, of packed primitives to procedurally like move them, shrink them, rotate them and stuff like that to animate kind of a uh, very stylistic type of uh, destruction, or you could even do more like motion graphics kind of stuff with it. Um, but it's going to be more of like a tool building technical kind of stream and stuff like that. <laughs> you need to sleep for tonight. Yeah, we got pretty far. So, the, so uh, Saturday or tomorrow we'll be doing, hopefully finishing or getting this tire burnout stuff looking better. Um, we ended it last time in a pretty good place, but there's still there were still some other lighting comments. Uh, Alex and some other people were bringing in, um, having it having it look uh, some cooler light sources. Um, I think the lower camera angle we ended up switching to is a little bit more successful. Um, but yeah, just bringing in some cooler light sources, tweaking. The headlights a little bit more right now the the car the the lights going through the bottom of the car and there's some issues 
uh, possibly adding some skid mark, some residual like tire tracks and stuff like that on the on the ground. I noticed Dr. Disrespect, <laughs> he's back streaming. He stole my, uh, I'm in uh, the United States in uh, Northern California. So I'm, it's Pacific time zone, it would be the same as Vancouver. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The puddle simulation. Yeah, maybe some mist or, or stuff like that. Is he live right now? Or is, is it, um, Oh, he is? He was just showing this scene of like a Lamborghini at a gas station for a long time. It looked, I think he had like the wet car shader and stuff going as well. Did anyone see that? <laughs> it reminded me of, of the, the stuff we had been working on. I don't know if I can find any pictures of that Lamborghini. I don't think I'm allowed to show uh, Pictures of Dr. Disrespect, because he got banned from Twitch. So I can't put it on here. Um, but yeah, he was doing some kind of like cyber... The, the the quality of that animation he was playing wasn't super nice. It was a little kind of After Effects heavy, it looked like. There was like lightnings that were fading in and out. Um, just, just like an image that was like multiplied on top that was getting faded in and out that didn't look too professional, but I'm sure it's just like quick graphics made in, in a day or something like that. Um, 500,000? Is that a lot? That's more comparatively, like to compared to Ninja and stuff? Jack Saran, how's it going? Yes, yeah, so I'm thinking, I don't know, you could just get a lot of interesting lighting situations. So something rock based uh cave cave based or something kind of like that these were some I was trying out different uh grain settings here with the uh changing the attraction um weight attraction weight by an attribute so that's what these colors is visualizing is like different um clumping strengths or stiffnesses or whatever like that. I did a whole bunch of wedges. Bust, how's it going? I did a whole bunch of wedges with different patterns and stuff like that. I'm still the node network. So <laughs> we were talking about doc Dr. Disrespect earlier. Um, he was doing, he had a visualization of like a Lamborghini that he was playing for his stream graphics that looked similar to uh, the Lamborghini Murcielago thing that I've been working on. But yeah, this node network, basically what I did was in here, you send this to the farm um, and then you can use this op farm. So basically this is setting the switch to the op digits of this. So you can do, it is like a broke kind of way to do wedging, but basically you just wedge through all of these like that. Cause I wanted to do different, these VOP networks here, I was setting up different procedural noises to test out or whatever like that. Yeah, I could show the concept or anything, any of his graphics. I think it, you just can't, I think the rules, the Twitch rules are you can't play his voice and you can't uh, show their, the face. It's a very clan. <laughs> It's a very clandestine <laughs> banning system that, that Twitch has invented. But uh, yeah, we'll get started going through a new scene, entering the Friday, uh, official Friday cool zone. Talking about your Pixar type grain, how do you address the shape of the ground that has to be artistically directed rather than dropping uh, the particles from top and making the ground? Uh, it depends what kind of uh, ground or, or stuff you're trying to make. Um, I think in their, in their um, breakdown, 
they kind of did a good job showing it. Um, it was like Z8 editing. How's it going? Um, right below the look dev area. I think I went too far down. Right here, you can kind of see it. That basically, I think what they're doing is scattering on a terrain, and then below that, they just have a texture, um, like a similar pattern shader. You could even bake your own sand textures, like if you did an orthographic render of a flat plane with the sand on it, kind of like a substance approach or something. But um, I think that's what they were doing for, for most of the shots that didn't have a flat, a completely flat ground or something like that. Yeah, so today we're doing another cool zone. Um, it was going to be something kind of with these cave type of noise, um, procedural noise generation type stuff. So we'll get started with this. Umer, how's it going? <laughs> You're just, I'm running late, but you're perfectly uh, coming in at the right time right now. So just get this window resized. Maybe turn down the music a little bit just in case. Yeah, feel free to PM me. Um, some other people have done it. I don't, I don't mind it too much. I'm not on Discord all all the time. Like I, sometimes I only check in once or twice a day, so I might there might be a delay getting back to you. But I'll usually uh, go, hop on there once or twice a day and just answer or check out what's going on. So I'm just gonna start with a box, and um, um yeah. The, so Discord and Twitter, I think, are really the only. Uh, I, I have LinkedIn, I don't really use it that much. And then I have Facebook, but I rarely ever use Facebook. Um, but the only reason I would, I use Facebook is just to jump on and share my tutorials or, or links or stuff like that, but I don't even really maintain a profile. Um, so just Twitter and, uh, I think my LinkedIn, some of that stuff is in the, the, uh, Discord is probably the best. I mean, Twitter, I might be a little bit more responsive, but yeah. Um, and then in the, all that stuff is in my uh, Twitch about page or, or tab or whatever, if you go over to that. Which scenes? Um, I could go over that maybe later today if I'm doing something that's... Um, slower, like waiting for a render or uh, some geometry or something like that to, to bake out. Um, but yeah, I could, I could go through that when I have some time. The Discord, <laughs> hopefully you're enjoying it. I don't know if the burnout, <laughs> you might just have to go into the Twitch VODs for that Naranjos. Um, I didn't upload one of the burnouts to YouTube because I spent like an hour of it trying to get a, the uh, shader to work. I didn't realize I had, when you use the pyro post-process node, um, this has the volume visualization and material assignment built in. Um, so it basically overrides your redshift shader and breaks your, your material assignment. Yeah, so I didn't upload it to YouTube because I figured it was a waste of people's time, maybe. <laughs> but it's in it's in the Twitch VODs for, for now and it will go away in, in a few days or 45 days or something like that. But um, sending your agenda. This is political sounding. <laughs> By the way, I am sending you my manifesto. I hope it is not too political. <laughs> No, it's okay. Feel, feel free to send me whatever you want. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm just going to do volume uh, from this box. If you just do one, you'll fill it with uh, an empty gap. Yeah, so I feel like it, I mean, there wasn't that much progress I made with that part four. So that's why it got uh, omitted. Sometimes if the streams 
there are some of the older ones too that just didn't end up being that professional. So sometimes with those, I just won't. Uh, there was like an older RBD one that I ran into some problems and it just had committed too many blunders. So sometimes with those, I just don't uh, just let them fade away into the <laughs> the ether. For those about to rock. <laughs> so I'm just doing a volume. Um, sometimes I, I think that these volumes are a good way to start making terrains or, or rocks. Um, the best part of the stream is I found these new tips and tricks generally. <laughs> yeah, I need to do, I, I wanna start like clipping more of those out or compiling um, a section for them and, and stuff like that. I saw the one, um, this one guy, Paul Ambrosium. I think that's how you pronounce his last name. But he's started compiling a Google spreadsheet of little tips and stuff like that. Um, I was like reading through it. One thing that he did mention was like, this is pretty cool. Um, if you want to delineate your your um, numbers, you can use underscores like you would with commas. So sometimes for readability um, with really big numbers, it makes it easier to read like 1 million instead of, um, it's gonna take some time to do this. But it, for readability, I guess sometimes it makes it simpler to, to comprehend these big numbers. Like with Houdini, I, it's just easy to see like this max points if you wrote this with um, the underscores, it's just easier to, to figure out the um, size of the number. So that was one thing that I found in his, uh, the mountaintop, how's it going? Thanks for, for uh, coming in. Um, yeah, so th that's one thing that, that I, I already saw from his little tips, but it was like just little one sentence um, things and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, so there's just sharing the little quick workflow stuff. I want to start clipping more of those out or I don't know, dedicating like a 10 minute portion of, of streams or something to that area. We're just going to get started now with uh, the cool zone stuff. So I'm starting to build a uh, noise generator for a cave type of scene. Um, yeah, and I'm starting with a 3D volume. So with Houdini, they have the height fields. Um, and this is actually set up like a 2D volume, like a, an image would be, like a JPEG or PNG image. You have X, Y, and Y resolution. Um, so that's what this height is, is just X and Y. The Z, or the, the height of it, is always one, and then the voxel value at these positions contains the, the height value, or how high to make it. Um, so these are 2D volumes, but sometimes you could get nice underground stuff with 3D volumes. Um, I didn't remove the bot, it might be broken right now. I haven't changed the Me Too uh, bot settings or anything like that. Um, you have learned a lot just seeing the streams. Thank you. Yeah, it's hard for me to find a good, or to know what a good um, pace and like balances and stuff like that, especially with just a chat or, or um, doing things remotely like this, but hopefully either this or then the like tutorials I'm doing for YouTube are more introductory based. But yeah, when I was teaching on site at the, um, like the Academy of Art or it's like a college class, but it was easier to see when, when people were falling asleep and you were getting too, <laughs> too lost in the sauce or too, too dry and stuff like that. And you could pull yourself out and, and get it, uh, get people back like caught up a little bit easier with that. But I feel like this format, it's it's hard to know when people are just completely lost or you're just uh, too deep into an explanation or something. So with this, these volumes, um, <laughs> you're like an owl. With these volumes, um, I just wanna go to VDB. And then with VDB, you can convert it to polygons. Yeah, have a good night. I'll, I'll check out your Discord uh, message after the, the stream. Thanks for the raid as well. Um, 
So I want to convert this one to VDB. So when you're doing volumes this way, instead of a height field, you can basically get like overhangs and, and three dimensional structures and stuff like that. So with the height fields, um, you'll never really, like you can add these after the fact with um, extra shapes or models and stuff like that, but you'll never, just the, the technical limi limitations of a height field because it's a two dimensional volume, you can't have an overhang structure like that. So that's why I'm starting with a, a 3D volume this way. It might seem a little bit weird or unorthodox or whatever. Um, but yeah, for, for cave based or underground terrains, I think that these uh, volumetric modeling is a really underused uh, workflow. This anti-alias noise, I feel like every, <laughs> every cool zone stream, this, this noise is used at least once. It's like a sponsor. This stream brought to you by anti-aliased noise. The, the reason people use this is just because it's like the, uh, I think it's the computationally, it's the easiest or most, one of the most efficient noises. And then it just doesn't have too many settings. And it also supports the fourth um, component. This turbulent noise, you can only do 3D noise, but if you want to adjust evolve it over time you you can't do it unless you like slide the noise in along an axis and then it looks a little bit uh, unnatural or whatever so sometimes i was also doing like you can feed these noises in together and then get interesting uh stuff the anti-alias is usually my go-to like this is the starting point it depends a lot on what what your end goal is or what you're trying to do with the noise but Anti-AS, like the Perlin noise, this is like the original noise that the Ken Perlin guy invented, like for the really old Tron movie. Um, this is like the building block of a lot of computer graphic stuff. Uh, so all these other noises are like later um, additions or, or new inventions. The simplex is just meant to be an optimized version of Perlin, like more, more efficient for the CPU to, to compute for higher dimensions, like four dimensions here um but but yeah i think it's a lot of it's just up to <laughs> perlin noise go brrr. a lot of it's just up to you and what uh what you're trying to achieve like there's there's different reasons to use scalar 3d noises or the different things i think a lot of it's just practice and like trying them out seeing what what uh what they do So I'm using this turbo noise right now, turb, turb noise, <laughs> so I just call it the turbo noise, um, to do like a distortion. I think I did it too much. That was pretty cool though, when it was like bubbly. Um, but yeah, I think my frequency when I was doing like the middle mouse ladder vector to vector for turbo turbulence noise i think it doesn't support it right i've tried that before but um like it won't this one will change but i think that these the way that they program this this node or whatever they don't support it but I've, i'm just adding it here to um basically <clears throat> displace the fourth dimension of the noise with with my turbulent noise. If you want to, you can always add, um, you continue to, to do like the time-based stuff by adding. So it's already distorted and then you can still add or uh, evolve time across stuff to get interesting results. Um, but yeah, I think for right now, I don't, I just want it to be static. Um, so I took the, the turb noise and I'm just making it a really low frequency. Uh, and then you can start to make the uh, amplitude quite high to get some large scale kind of warping, like directional uh, kind of distortions. I think this one's pretty cool. Um, I don't know, a lot of underground concept art or forms seem to have this like spiky, like angular, 
rock structures or stuff like that. Um, so I think that helps like just with making a nice composition and stuff. And then this, at a certain point, you probably want to go up to a higher voxel count. Um, it will make everything slower, but it, it's the only way to start getting like some really nice details. Um, and then you have this ISO value. So this is basically you compute the noise and then this value, if I slice it, ISO value is where you're saying you want to build the surface. So if I'm saying like 0 0.001, basically it will uh, draw a border in 3D space around this area. Um, is what just depends. You kind of use it like you're eroding or uh, expanding stuff, kind of. This stuff is, I don't know, it's a little too repetitive, or chunky. Chunky. I think this roughness here is. So I might go back to a lower voxel count just to work more interactively for now. This is already starting to be pretty pretty interesting. So this warp here is basically creating the this lattice or like this this slats or whatever. So without it you can see we're just getting a somewhat typical noise. It just looks very generic, but then once you start to add this uh warping it just makes things look you could get some some interesting forms. Usually I find that the, this um, volume bop, or like volume noise workflow is nice to get the base structure. But then when you want to start adding the more like subtle details, you can either do the mountain stuff, just dial it down to do a very um, subtle kind of layer of, uh, of detail. Some of this stuff is flipping around. Um, or do a surface like uh, in the shader, do a displacement there. You're never gonna be able to get full high quality um, details from the, the volume noise uh, workflow. This is cool. We could go back to the smooth shaded. Just take a look at how much uh, is changing the lighting. So I might still go back down. I think I'm still gonna mess around with some of these. Uh, offset, just use that like a seed, like a random number generator or whatever. Each of these you type in will just be a random result, pretty much. So I just keep track of the original one that, that it was set up before I started changing it. Um, that was just five. You could either set the, if I want to go back to it, just type it in. Um, you could either make like a save file or sometimes you just keep track of it in your head just in case you can't find a better location of the noise. It's kind of like going going on a little journey, <laughs> going for a, for a walk, see if you find a more interesting area. Uh, if not, just go back to your save point, back to restore your checkpoint. This stuff is pretty cool. 
maybe by less uh, warping. I think this area is starting to be something. And then you can always treat this, like once you start to find a composition, you can treat this bounding box here like a window and move it around so that you're optimizing uh, all of your voxels and you're, you're making, you're just using your, your volume more efficiently. Like if I was to place a camera here, we could crop out a lot of that extra stuff and then run our run our stuff at a higher resolution. So I might start to do that. Um, I think my plan is with this hole right here, kind of use that like a, a light source or something like that. Um, yeah, that's this spot. I think is starting to feel like a, an underground. We found <laughs> we found an interesting location. That's all that it is kind of, you're offsetting the noise. It's just like taking a walk if you're a photographer trying to find an interesting uh, part of a landscape to start like photographing or interesting lighting conditions or stuff. Um, you've gone spelunking. <laughs> yeah, I've gone on a, a mission proceeds. We've, <laughs> underground exploration. Um, so with if you only want to displace within an area like a cube or something like that, um, you can't really control it too much with this, be exploring procedural features. Um, just the nature that this noise is, like, I guess you could maybe have some control if you wanted to do, um, control the roughness. But right now, because we're starting from scratch, we can't really control too much of like, I don't know. You, you could kind of erase or poke out holes at a certain point. Like if I just make um, this sphere into a VDB. Um, the VDB tool set is really nice for modeling procedurally. Um, is you can combine, it's kind of like a uh, greedy coat or whatever the, the there's one, uh, I think, um, ZBrush has some voxel-based sculpting as well, but this is kind of what we're doing is like voxel-based sculpting of noises. Um, so if I just do combine, what we would want to do is go to uh, SDF first um, with this fogged SDF. Th that's more like a surface that you could um, just want to keep this ISO value the same. And we can still see our area there. Um, so this combine is just like compositing any operation. Um, you just do either union, intersection, or difference. It's like a pretty much like a Boolean. So if you had like a, a sculpture or something like that, you could put it in. Um, if you do uh, difference, like cutting it out, I could punch out, like if this is some structure that someone built to, to worship worship the orb god in the middle of this. Um, and then intersection would be like a, a mask to say only inside of this area. So those are the, the big options is like combine, um, this is like a window or like, this is like um, A minus B pretty much. What are some other industries Houdini users might find themselves in aside from the common ones like film, advertising, and games? Uh, it gets used, it's getting used more and more. Um, there were always a lot of architecture type of people looking into it. I don't know how much professionally it gets used for that, but I know it's a graph. Um, one, one college on somewhere on the East Coast was always uh, doing interesting like workshops or demos for doing procedural architecture with Houdini. Um, I think it's getting used more and more in tech for other other industries. Um, a lot of the learning based stuff like self-driving vehicles or, or automation type of fields are starting to use it. Um, if you look around on maybe LinkedIn or like 
start to do more advanced searches, you can see some of this stuff. Um, but because it's handles like big data sets so easily, it gets used for a lot of tech kind of uh, cases like that, where you're trying to, to do those types of things. Yeah, so this is if you want to sculpt things. And then just because I set the ISO value earlier, now you just set it to zero if you're dealing with um, converting it to an SDF first. So yeah, I th I'm thinking I'm, I'm just gonna put the camera inside of here. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I, I don't really want to break, I don't want to disclose <laughs> trade secrets, but I think, um, let me see if this works. So you could read about this here. This is all like, they're talking about some 3D applications and stuff. Um, this is just public information. I'm not disclosing anything, but there people are using these 3D softwares for, for other roles of uh, kind of machine learning or bigger tech purposes or stuff like that. So we got our camera set. Um, we don't, we don't want to do that noise right now. I'm just going to start, um, probably just refine some of the, uh, sometimes this camera icon sometimes is a little bit too big. I don't know. It's like misleading. Um, so I think under view, if you just scale the, the icon size down, it's, it's like we, we shrunk our man down. It's a little guy now. Before it was just too, too big. Um, so yeah, if we want to just contain this this area, you can either adjust the box itself, or sometimes I'll use clips. So I do this a lot with um, setting the pyro domain, because these are more optional. Like I could toggle this on and off instead of up here. Is, this is a more destructive change to be um, changing those parameters. But like this is nice. So now I could go back to my camera and just see like did this mess up my composition or it looks like it didn't. Um, so we got this top of it kind of cut off. Um, now I just want to probably do the, the sides. So instead of the Y direction, um, I think we could just do X. I think we have to do Z. Let's see if this, I think we're still good. And then because this is uniform sampling divisions, it just lets you use more, more detail in this area. So if you look in wireframe, you should be able to see the, uh, the voxel size kind of spike up a little bit. Maybe because it's max axis, it's not, uh, fully using all the you could also switch this maybe just to by voxel size and it will start to be a little bit easier to control I'm thinking we can get a little bit more efficient over here volume works with open geo um it did yeah so this isn't necessarily like if i was doing a vdb i couldn't do it this way but this dotted line just means to reference information about the geometry it's not using it um so under 
internally, like the, this volume node is saying, give me the bounding box or the bounds of this geometry and then make a volume out of it. So that's why you can do open geometry with this. This is a special volume. Um, you could see at the bottom here, when I hover over it, it says bounding source. Um, if I was doing the ISO offset or other things that are trying to do a volume conversion, you could see it's failing. But because I'm just using this to set the, the proper, like the uh, domain, the I'm setting the resolute, like the, the canvas size kind of, you, you don't need to, to worry about it being open or closed or whatever. So yeah, I think I just slid that over a little bit um, and I can be a little bit more efficient. We still don't see any, uh, we might have, we might have gone a little bit too far. I'll just slide that back. I think we're good. If you want more, um, I might want some more stuff happening below us. Um, so I'm just gonna use a transform node here and just move. Yeah, so with this volume, we're basically just saying like, only generate terrain or, or cave stuff within this area. Um, so because it's being used in that sense and not saying like, convert this geometry into uh, into a volume, it's you can just give it a, a thing and it will use the size of it. So I'm just taking a little bit more time than I should to set this up, but it kind of makes sense to do it because once you have it um, the way you want it, then you can really start to push stuff and get uh, some of the, the little intricate features and stuff like that. Thanks for sharing your expertise. <laughs> yes, I'm happy to share the knowledge and stuff like that. Um, you working these days with studios or are there less offerings due to the virus? Uh, it seems, I, I don't know. I've seen some more, um, emails or stuff floating around. Um, I think that more studios are starting to, to open up and places that were historically only working on site are starting to go more remote because of the virus. Um, so I think it's kind of changing things in that regard. <laughs> Nature is healing. Yeah, maybe. We'll see. It could be a positive net effect for all of us, or it could just be another um, step in the march to the bottom of uh, labor wages and that kind of thing. It's hard to know what, what the large scale effects will be. <laughs> So I'm just going to go maybe back lower with the sampling and then I'm just going to adjust some of these noise um, settings to try to get more, more detail or stuff like that. So this roughness, you, if you push it too much, <laughs> You push it too much, you'll start to get detached shapes. Um, I think I'm just gonna go into the um, So I think I might just want to add noise to the position because that will keep us from getting stuff uh, isolated by itself. Did you convert it to a poly soup or regular polygons? I think I did poly soup for right now. Um, 
just for the viewport visualization, it's more efficient. But um, sometimes going to regular polygons, then you can do a measure and like find isolated areas and, and clean that stuff up. But um, usually when I try to, to set this stuff up, I'll try to do everything like in one go. And the more post-process stuff you rely on, the just slower overall, like everything um, becomes to work with. But there could be an option to, to run an, an extra task that finds floating shapes or like it only keeps the biggest piece of 3D connected geometry, essentially. Um, but yeah, we're, right now I'm just going to add a 3D noise to the... Um, input point position is just going to be another kind of distortion. See what happens. You might want to go. I'm thinking we just want to go back to a lower uh, thing to work more interactively again. So you could see this is basically warping every uh, everything at like a low frequency. But if we go up, so this hopefully should just be like perturbing the edges, but not uh, not generating new nonsense in the middle and everything. So this is kind of like working uh, more precisely now or whatever we've found like our broad form or the broad structure that we want. And now we're just dialing in and uh, trying to enhance things. Sometimes with these noises, it's nice to uh, just change one one of the frequencies to be lower than the others, especially with caves, like just switching the Y to be a low frequency, then you can start to get um, stalactites or, or horizontal, uh, like vertical structures. And if you go the other way, then you'll get horizontal layers or something like that. So especially if I make these 3D things quite flat, um, I don't know what type of rock this is, but it's like the uh, sheets that like stick out. I don't know. It's more of like a canyon or some uh, like a desert canyon or something like that feel. Um, and then going the other way with the stretching out things vertically. I feel like that's more of a underground cave type of vibe. Right? Do you have any geologists in the chat? So this roughness, I feel like you want it to be, you want to be somewhat careful with it. Um, it's easy to push it too, too high and then everything gets like too gnarly to look at visually. I think it might already be a little too, too much. Basically like you crank it too high and you see too many repetitive structures that are all like the same shape and stuff like that. So this could be could be nice to start with. Sometimes what you can try to to start to do um, if you want to fill in other areas, you can use parts of the existing structure. So 
So I'm just going to flip this. Whoa. <laughs> we obscured ourselves. So I'm planning, I think, to put um, some water or something in here filling this out, but just to have uh, more detail or something like that happening, this, this could be an option to do. So I don't know how high I'm going to push this volume, but I think we'd still go a little bit higher. Right now I'm just looking at the end result. Um, convert to VDB node, and basically the, the, the output points, we're still below a million, so it's not even that high of a resolution for terrain and stuff like that. Um, so maybe like 575. Um, we're working in like a rectangular shape so this max access isn't if you're working out in a box 575 might be a bit too high i think it's time to save this stuff is a pretty reliable these vops are pretty reliable but if i yeah if i start doing redshift or it's a good checkpoint So just do this twenty twenty eight seven. I need to, to make a bot with a timer that says you need to save your scene. So this is gonna be save cool. So yeah, just adding the the higher resolutions. Now we're above a million. Um, starting to look just a little bit more realistic. Um, sometimes you can do this adaptivity stuff, but you can see it's kind of stripping some of the detail. Um, so what it's doing, if you look at the mesh, is just trying to represent flatter areas with less polygons. But um, I've also found sometimes it can make like uh, artifacts for for rendering, but it is nice, especially with these like edges of the container um, to to transition to a lower resolution for those. So I might keep it like this for right now. Um, maybe start put in some lights and see what happens. We'll do the RS light. It's, when you first put it down, I love it. It always looks like a uh, graphic novel, like a Frank Miller movie or something like that. For whatever reason, these redshift lights are always uh, in the viewport, super overexposed. It's kind of weird. Um, but yeah, I'm just going to go into the light and uh, I'm going to move it. Where did that? I'm trying to find the place that I was like looking through. Yeah, I think it was the, this area right here. Um, so just trying to shine like a beam of light through that area. Maybe for right now, I'm just going to start with the grid um to put underneath everything we'll make a redshift take a look so we probably definitely want to add some bounce light 
GI. Look at that. Makes it <laughs> professional with just one, the one button that's like, make it photo real. I think, <laughs> I think this um, area light, I don't know, I might just start with a spotlight for right now, just to get uh, harder shadows kind of. Go back into the light. Just gonna go up with this. Gonna do that. Um, this could be more interesting. We're gonna see the the second step you do to make it final. Just go and turn on the uh, <laughs> environment fog and uh, turn on your contribution. Trying to get like a god ray or something like that. But yeah, I feel like if you just do uh, GI bounces and um, god rays, you're pretty much good to go. I think I might have too much stuff leaking in from the other direction. Like it's not all going through that one hole. There's some other gashes and stuff. You put like light light blockers and stuff up, but I think it's kind of background HDRI required. I think um, I don't think you definitely you don't necessarily need a background HDRI. Um, for this, I, I'm not planning to add one for the time being, just because I don't want to... Uh... I guess it maybe is a back plate or something like that, but uh, I don't want any extra. I just want a simple single light source. Um, but yeah, I'm, I think I'm, for right now, I'm just gonna turn that volume stuff off. Um, I'm gonna switch this. You love how consistent it is with Redshift, the results. I've never used it in another application. I've never tried it, but um, from what I've seen, yeah, the results with uh, Cinema 4D, Redshift is on par and everything's pretty cool. So I'm gonna switch this grid to a box. I think I'm just gonna go lower with it. So with this box, you can kind of use it like the volume, like I was doing it with the volume node. So if I just copy another grid, and then with this box, it's just gonna make a box that will encapsulate the, the bounding box of, of this node. So again, that's the dotted wire that's saying, it's not necessarily using the geometry, but it's referencing an aspect or a property of this, the output of this node. So in, that, in this case, it's the, the bounding box information. Um, so I'm making, I'm making thickness to the, that, um, grid. Uh, and the reason I want to do that is because I want to add like a shader to it that has absorption or, um, attenuation or stuff like that. Let's start, this one's just going to be the cave one. And then this, I'm going to call it water. So just apply those. I guess just start with the cave one. Um, probably by default, these always come like the settings of plastic. Um, you would see too that you just see too much smooth reflection of the light. Um, you want some roughness. 
just see what that looks like. So I only changed the cave for now. I think my light, I was like balancing it a little bit too much for, uh, for white, but it's always, I feel like it's always nice to have some very dark, moody shadow areas. Um, and then for the water, I might start with the tinted. Ooh. <laughs> Someone's been boiling some lava. Um, so yeah, that's why I made it have thickness or whatever. I think... I might go higher with my light. And then... Uh, do some kind of roughness. I think with the scattering, this is like, you have uh, little particles or stuff scattering in your, that's kind of how I envision it. Like if a fish swims by with its tail and scatters up the uh, soil and sediment or whatever on the bottom of the water, this is like scattering that stuff up. So it's little things in, little particulates in the uh, medium that, that uh, catch the light. It's like a, a fantasy. <laughs> Julian, how's it going? Saw the cave. <laughs> I do look like a caveman myself. Un, un, uh, no haircut for months. No shave. I think this is an interesting... I don't know, I was planning to just do one color, but you, you can switch these two around and get uh, like a differentiation in color. This is kind of interesting too. This is, might be like sulfur or something like that is uh, affecting the area. Um, yeah, I don't know. The roughness... I think sometimes the roughness is nice just to have like because it's applying to the refraction roughness as well so like immediately when things go below the water they start to become quite blurry i think this is okay for right now with cave i don't know i feel like this triplanar is a good one to uh to do so this is doing like uv projections for um each axis and blending between it so instead of using uv maps or uh, uv attributes or uv projections it's doing it along each axis and then blending basically you can specify how smooth or it's like the contrast of the blend um but yeah this is just the lazy man's way to to apply a, a image a texture to a thing that doesn't have UVs. So let's go into uh I think with my materials folder. I think all of these are from that C C0, CO0 textures or whatever. Um, but yeah, I'm just looking for something that's kind of, we might, we could go uh, online and try to find one if these don't work. But even like an asphalt, like something that just has a little bit of interesting stuff happening to it. Um, I don't know what's happening. This quartz is a bit smooth.
I don't know, I might just do a max on noise. So if you stay with this, these noises, um, they'll just use the object space. So you don't, again, you don't have to worry about um, UV attributes and stuff like that. Is there a shortcut to solo a node, a regif node? I believe there is, I don't remember. Someone, someone in the chat probably knows it. Um, the cool zone, <laughs> Kieran, how's it going? Good to see you. Um, yeah, someone was saying that there's a shortcut, especially because I'm using the Redshift 3.0, that will look at the output of a node. The green flag. You're saying this one's green? Let me try it with uh, this. The debug flag. Maybe I need to turn on the stop level updates. I'm also just gonna switch to the automatic sampling while I'm over here. I don't know. I'm having trouble seeing it. I guess it was. I don't know. Oh, it has to be. It has to be something because it like compiles it together. Um, yeah. So I'll try it once I get going a little bit more. Um, but yeah, with these noises, it's nice because it's not relying on projection planes or axes. Um, it's using the object space and uh, generating a procedural pattern, kind of like we generated this mountain, the uh, terrain. It's good. My Friday, my Friday is just getting started. I'm on the uh, the Western time zone, but uh, yeah, it's it's pretty good. Excited for the weekend. Got the big schedule going. MKI Alex, good to see you. <laughs> yeah, your Friday is pretty much over already. Um, so yeah, we'll just do some different noises here. Um, Uh, it's 2.15 for me right now. So this stuple is looking pretty good. Um, maybe just starting it with a color mix and using this to drive the, the bias or the blend between the two. Um, so we're saying this is like a cave Something made out of mud or dirt or something like that. The Rebelway asset course. I didn't. I, I never saw any of the Rebelway. Um, I do remember the the one trailer that the guy, the one guy made, um, where he was combining VDB stuff together. I think to make rocks. So I'm just viewing the raw color now but if we want to see it more in the context of a cave um i was planning just to drive this with the diffuse color and then because we have the i kind of baked the the color intensity into those um we probably just want to go all the way back up to the full diffuse weight So I don't know if my, I feel like my stuff is a little out of balance right now, but uh, maybe you see a cave. Kind of like this. Yeah, so the, the um, I have a box right now for this water stuff. And then the volume, I started with a box and was doing the ISO, uh, ISO value and just doing a noise uh, generator here. And then, yeah, using the ISO value to make the surface. It's pretty good for, for underground stuff, I feel like. Um, I think 
one of these is just a bit too saturated. I have two websites. <laughs> yeah, the Mr. Coons one I'm, is kind of depreciated or somewhat outdated. I, I pretty much stopped updating that. Um, I'm slowly moving stuff to the uh, to the johncoons.com. The rocks under the surface don't appear darker. Um, yeah, I think those are like reflections right now or something, but also the, um, yeah, I think that the scatter scale, like this increases the light for whatever reason. Um, it's not really physically based, I guess, in that sense, like it doesn't conserve energy properly. Um, I don't know if you want, you, if you really want it to conserve energy, I think you have to combine these, <laughs> you have to combine these, um, values maybe. It's like a weird way of working kind of that, that Redshift has. Um, it might be like extinction. You're working with like extinction it will be more physically based but i feel like the redshift glass um <laughs> yeah i don't know I, I feel like i don't know enough for redshifts to the sponsor um but yeah I, I do feel like that's one thing you do have to keep an eye on is um with this scatter scale if you make it too too high or certain values it can be uh like glowing materials. I don't know if anyone has a a good uh, kind of workaround for that. I've, I've usually just done it by eye or whatever and tried to line it, make it look um, more realistic kind of at different points. Um, but yeah, I think we might want more, I think we might want something kind of happening in this area. Um, you try going back to the, so what I was doing here was just duplicating everything and flipping it around. I'm going the wrong, going the wrong way. So what I might do, um, maybe for right now, I'm just going to do a grid. Let's just see what this looks like combined. Uh, I don't know. I think we want to kind of fill in that that area a little bit more.
Yeah, I was playing around with the guide rays earlier. Um, yeah, there was some... I, I was looking just at a quick search of the uh, underground stuff. Um, I had some rough... I wasn't following a specific composition or something like that, but just... <laughs> a jinx. Just looking through some of this stuff. Some spelunking missions or um, anything, anything with this kind of uh, these kind of vibes, kind of. But yeah, and then earlier I did um, turn on uh, the volumetric boom. <laughs> I was just sometimes I turn this off to do more visually see see more of what's going on um it's kind of i kind of view it like a fine finishing touch type of thing um i was still trying to see what was uh the viewport looks like destroyed cheese <laughs> yeah this uh, the uh volume with the noise and then iso surface is a good way to make different kinds of cheeses I don't know why this, I feel like this attenuation or something isn't really working. Cheese, <laughs> make the cheese sap. Don't you guys usually uh, feel like I should be, things should be getting darker. I guess I'm just, maybe I'm working at a lower scale than I usually do. But yeah, I think you want the attenuation stuff a bit higher so that this stuff isn't like infinitely uh traveling. You want it to kind of roll off, I guess, a little bit. This God Ray stuff has trouble with Octane. Um, you can kind of do some stuff with Mantra, but it's just slow, <laughs> like everything else with with Mantra. Um, but you can definitely do it. I think this this kind of lighting might be the best. Um, I think that they have, Mantra has like a volume fog node that's meant to be pretty um, efficient at, at computing that. So I think it's, um, <laughs> yeah, you can do a one by one giant volume. Um, and then I think if you just do they have a uniform volume node, or it might be a property. Um, <laughs> so the, if you have a one by one by one giant volume, it will do the ray march. Um, you can do it at like a higher voxel size, essentially. So that's kind of what Redshift is doing, is you can't, I, I guess with Redshift, if you want to, you kind of sign a shader to this stuff and modulate the god rays. but. Yeah, Mantra, I, if I was doing it before, I was doing a one by one by one voxel, or maybe 10, I don't know, um, box. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's uh, still kind of broad strokes, I feel like, but it's uh, it's an interesting composition. We, uh, we, we're we further than we usually are in these cool zones. I think last week I was doing too many simulations and stuff, and. Uh, Lost, lost in the pyro 
advection grain stuff. I still want to go back and, and mess around with that Einstein one. I was just busy with uh, the burnout and um, and finishing up the grain character tutorial. So I'm gonna just maybe do some noise uh, for a bump map. Um, so just to get the, the top layer of like surface detail. Took longer than you thought. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's just any simulation I feel like in general um, because it takes like any simulation to get good results, it's going to take you 10 minutes or so to um, to get your your feedback and see what the changes you did, what it what uh, results it produced. So because you're working at that slower cycle, it's just uh, it's going to set you back. But it's so cool to do is you definitely get you need to do it sometimes to get the results you want. So with this, I'm, I'm just trying to make something that's going to give us some surface detail. Um, we might want to stretch this again, like we were doing with the volume noise, to get uh, the vertical uh, stretching. Crunching. Yeah, yeah it's, thanks for stopping by, checking in. I don't know if this... Booyah. This booyah could be cool. Let me, uh, looks kind of a bit more rocky. The booyah kasha <laughs> noise algorithm. So yeah, well, I'll just, um, I'm just going to put it into a bump for right now. I think that we're switching over to displacement might be too uh, too slow for right now. You could do it at the very end, but like uh, it just puts a halt on everything and makes your your uh, scene generation time like hits the brakes. I think this should just break up some of the highlights. Like it's everything before was quite smooth. Let's, let's give this a try. It doesn't work. Does it, it needs to be something plugged into surface, I'm guessing. Let me see if it works with this one. Ah. I don't know. I, I might have messed it up. Looking good already. Yeah, it's a, we're making some progress. It's uh it's getting closer. So I think I'm just trying to eke some more stuff out of this noise. Um we do the gain. This is like roughness um, with the Houdini noises, but I think the redshift ones work the, the other way where the lower your gain, the more roughness you have. You showed the Pixar example and explained the references in the uh, tutorial. Yeah, I think it's a good, I don't know, I'm just trying to do more, go a little bit more in detail with those tutorials and like break down more of the process. A lot of the um, tutorials that are out there right now that I see is just going like technically like which buttons you need to push and stuff like that. But I think it's really just makes it a more useful tutorial for people just getting into Houdini or like even people who might not know Houdini at all and uh, just happen to like catch that tutorial. They are just more interested. Like if you're 
going too much into the technical stuff, you're just putting up a big barrier of like, none of this information is going to be useful to anyone except the people who are uh, looking to, to put these nodes in and, and change the values. I don't know if that, that was a bad explanation. <laughs> this is the, the rough gist of my thought with that. But yeah, I think that this stuff is starting to break the uh, the spec and surface a little bit better. I don't know, one of these... Uh... Maybe making this one of these noises a little bit brighter. Let me just take a look here. Ninety-five percent of any kind of tutorial online are easy to understand and follow for people that already understand the topic. Unfortunately, yeah, I think that's the hardest part about doing tutorials or teaching in general is like going. You have to like put your mind back into the mentality of not knowing anything. It's kind of a weird thought process or whatever to for people to go through. Some interesting secondary forms. Yeah, I think it's, everything might be a little bit too bright right now, but um, yeah, so what I've been trying to do going into this shader now is just detailing a lot of the stuff out so that it's not, um, it was like too smooth or whatever. Um, so I've been using Houdini maybe like eight or nine years or something like that, um, but through different, processes and stuff like not always doing this kind of stuff like sometimes just doing effects pyro simulations or, or things like that um but more recently i've been trying to get myself into more of a generalist workflow and doing other things that aren't just simulations like expanding my my uh capabilities to do more environments and uh look dev or concepting or just to do, the, the whole skill set. They're telling you which button to press, but does not explain why or what this button actually does. Yeah, so I mean, that's the most valuable part of tutorials to me is like the thought process because that's what makes it digestible to people who don't even know Houdini. Like if you watch a good, I've watched like really good um, Cinema 4D or or 3ds max tutorials or stuff like that and not even keeping up with those softwares you can adopt those skills to whatever dcc or whatever <laughs> digital content creation platform you're using or even if you're like you're just expanding the the audience like you could this uh, illustrator or like someone paint a painter could watch this tutorial and they they probably know more about this stuff than i do but you see what i'm saying like it just makes it more uh appealing to, to a broader base of people, I guess. So I think this, I'm gonna, I was trying contrast earlier, but I might just try power with um, this noise. Basically I want, I could maybe just switch these two values around, but I basically just want more of this stuff to be the darker color. Um, so I think we wanna go higher with our exponent. I don't know if that's too much. This noise here, I might have 
made it too repetitive. It was like too, uh, it's too, too noisy. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I think that this tower was a step in the wrong direction somewhat. Let's check out what's going on with this water. I don't know, we might want it. I feel like in the, some of the concepts and, and references and stuff, it can be quite, quite rough sometimes. I don't know. I guess this is just like the cone angle of the spotlight. But like this stuff, kind of rough. It's like two layer specularity or something with that one. This stuff is pretty cool. The cavern. We got to a good spot really quick. Yeah, it's, I feel like a lot of it is practice and knowing like when you've gotten to the limit of the tools like in the past i would spend too much time with the volume trying to get more of the detail in that area but um once you know like I, this is as far as i can push the volume based displacement now i can move to the shader and do more of the stuff there uh that's when it becomes easier or whatever to, to work quickly You have a cold environment in contrast to the warm god rays. Yeah, I think that could be better. Yeah, everything is a bit warm. Um, the water was... I don't know why it's not as blue. I think I messed up. Uh, something's going on. Something's <laughs> playing with my water. The, these absorption and scatter scale settings for water is pretty, it's a weird way to work. I feel like it's not uh, super intuitive right off the bat. Build a melting iceberg. This seems like a good approach. Yeah, I think especially for making the form, like you can get the, you just stretch out the noise vertically and you get the really nice um, structures like icebergs I, I don't know what the reference is but generally seems like they have like where they cracks off or whatever they they leave this jaggy stuff behind or, or whatever um but yeah i don't know what's going on with my i just beat the saturation Don't you think you'd see more uh, kind of subsurface vibes here? I don't know if I messed it up. I guess this is all just, maybe I need to go out of glass and adjust my IOR closer to water. Maybe it's just the scatter scale stuff. I 
I don't know. Could be um, the god rays and everything else is, is acting up a bit. Let's go into Alex's idea. Making the uh, cave environment cooler. I think this aqua, aquamarine stuff is pretty interesting. I might leave it uh, not super saturated. I don't know. I feel like that gets you too much of a uh, cartoon feeling too quickly. I might just leave it kind of like this for now. Let me see what's happening with this light. Yeah, I guess it's just that my, the maybe like the primary rays are the only things that uh, get attenuated or absorbed with the, the depth. They're just not seeing it too much here. I'm just gonna go down with the exposure. I think it's, we want more, more of the screen in uh, shadow. It's gonna help us, it's like cheating kind of. It's like more, less area you need to detail out kind of. I was just turning the volume contribution off to debug it. You could go, sometimes I do go above one. I might keep it back at closer to one. And then, I don't know if we're going more, uh, I think we were better closer to the yellow area. So that's pretty cool. Um, I'm thinking I want one more thing kind of going on with this save. I might save to a new version. Um, I think maybe, so this ground, I think we could add more samples or whatever, more resolution to the stuff. Let's see what this looks like. Yeah, I don't know. It was, um, I think it was better, more flat overall. Um, what I might do is just make the size of it bigger. I think it's, uh, is like the edge. We were seeing the edge somewhere. Um, and then I might just do another mountain node to, to add like a layer.
I think you can as well go to poly soup. Might be a little bit faster to render or whatever when you start doing like really high uh, resolution geometries. One thing that also is nice for good composition is to have big contrasts and values. So like very dark values in the foreground, then the highest value in the midground, and medium values in the background, at least when you're painting. No, it's, it's super helpful. This is the Bob Ross God tier advice. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I always need to work more on my composition type stuff. <laughs> Splash some paint. <laughs> yeah, I think this is a better, some better vibes in here. I think this, the water stuff is actually starting to be pretty cool. It's like, it's getting into a nice area where you can't really make out what's going on. It just feels murky under the water or whatever. Um, one thing we could, Could just try this real quick um doing a noise here for the bump to try to get some some low frequency uh distortions so i just want even something like this is probably okay to start with simulate some ripples i feel like um Sometimes what I've seen people do in game engines and stuff is like find the distance to the nearest surface and then run like a sine wave through that. Or just if you save that distance as a extra attribute, you can use it in the shader to make like procedural um, things. This bump is always just way too strong. But um, I feel like every game Water shader has that going on where like they have little things, uh, XYZ <laughs> opportunity detected. XYZ dist is one of the most powerful things. This is a, especially in Mantra. Like if you do um, the XYZ dist stuff in the shader, you can get really, you can build out really cool um, stuff. So I think it's starting to work <clears throat> with my bump. I might want to go negative one and one. Um, just so I'm going in both directions. We could try it at different uh, scales. Then I think maybe what's going to happen, let's try it one uh, direction. I think it's compositionally, it's better go in the other way. Perfectly smooth works too, because it's a cave. Yeah, I, was, I wasn't thinking, um, I think even right now I'm visualizing it heavy just to dial some stuff in but um and this is like an ocean cove yeah those things are pretty cool like off in in uh parts of the mediterranean or whatever they have a lot of little escapes over there um but yeah i was just planning like did i change anything there i render i was just planning some real kind of something even like this, um, just to add a little bit of uh, limestone on the coastline, just to add a little bit of, I don't know. There's always, I feel like a space this big, there's like some gusts of air moving around or something that's, something's going on. But yeah, I, I don't know. 
this is definitely more of like the pirates hideaway on the ocean or something. But I think having it, uh, you don't want it to be the first thing your eye looks at, I guess. You want it to just be there as like uh, a little bit of extra stuff. I think you could maybe try bringing the roughness down. Uh, I don't know. Like that. Yeah, this some of these shapes was pretty cool. Um, I think it was better with the roughness up a bit. Just so, very subtle implied detail, kind of. I don't know. More intense around the edges of the photo. Yeah, it might just be, um, I don't know, it might be because this, it's just because it's re what it's reflecting, but uh, this even this stuff here is pretty cool. Um, I'm just going to go back up a little bit with roughness, back down, just to cut back a little bit on this distortion stuff. But this was the kind of stuff I was talking about, um, I think on Wednesday with... Uh, doing this kind of thing with the water on the ground for the, the headlights, the damp asphalt, like even even less than this, like this kind of stuff, but just at like 1% or 10%, just to add a little bit of, um, it's like nothing in real life is ever perfectly level everywhere. You wanna tuck in a roughness map? Let's, let's get one of those going. So the roughness, I might switch to the FBM to get uh, some more layers of detail or whatever in it. And I don't know if... Maybe just make the scale bigger. And then I'm just going to do a change range. So I think we will, our range for the output, I'm just going to find like the min and max right here pretty quick. Um, so for roughness, um, yeah, for roughness, I think the smallest value we want is like 0 0.05, maybe 0 0.2 for the biggest. It's very uh, subtle, adding to our Adventure time. <laughs> Let's take a look at uh, this guy. Let it resolve. And then I'll do a screenshot and uh, you just unplug the, the roughness. Yeah, so I think that helps push. Uh, oops. Break up a little bit of that stuff little bit uh, more detail or whatever. So if we go back to it. And uh, I might Keep kind of adding some stuff. Um, I might do this like scatter. Maybe like, I don't know, not to plant or a tree or something, but maybe like some mineral or crystal or something. I'm just going to copy some spheres for these points. Um, visualize the other stuff. Probably don't want the iterations on.
So yeah, I don't know if these are some, <laughs> we scattered some gems inside of our cave. Um, so I'm just gonna play around with this noise and try to get them a little bit more uh, detailed. Jagged or something. I'm just trying to visualize them a little bit better. I'm thinking I want them to to be maybe more white or something to just to add something interesting. I guess we could also do um more like geometric angular type of stuff. Spikies. If we add the normal, we should get these um, aligned to the surface. I think we might be going on the wrong axis. Z. Yeah, I think we want to do Z to have it lined with the axis. Let's just see what happens with this. So I'm just gonna make a out node here. Uh, so we can make a different shader to it or whatever. And then I'm just gonna move the, maybe we'll do the output flag. So we don't have to worry about setting it all the time. Do object merge and get the uh, crystals and um, could just make another shader for them. Let's see what see what we get. I don't know. I think they're a little too big. They kind of break the scale of everything. Try doing these um, 
these things with a bump map that's pretty jagged just to make them really uh, catch some of the light in like interesting areas. I think I'm going the wrong way maybe with my noise. Yeah, I just want some little stuff happening. Maybe the Vornoi stuff gives you like, I guess we could try it just with the uh, cells. Doesn't seem like it's uh, doing too much right now. Might need a little bit more roughness to have it pick up. Maybe try some of this dispersion. I'm going to try a different type of noise. Looks like the inside of your ear. It might be going a little too yellow. It's kind of toxic or something. I think this... Uh... Somehow this height things got pretty crunchy pretty quickly. Nathan Fox, Schoolism. I might check that out. This is, uh, I feel like that's the, the most essential building block to learn. He's very good. And they also have one course with Craig Mullins, the godfather of concept art. I remember I was watching some, um, some older like recordings of uh, Sid Mead, the guy who did all the Blade Runner concept artwork. And uh, seeing him like, explain his process was amazing. He was like thinking like, just about the people he was drawing and then like what, what kind of gasoline they'd be using. So how that would change the look of the vehicles, like the, how it would influence their fashion and like just seeing everything, like all the little elements that went into <laughs> He's on another planet. Yeah, just seeing all the little considerations that like internally he's making and how it uh, changes the, the end result is amazing. 
Yeah, so I don't know if I want these green or a different color to pop just to catch your eye a little bit more. Yeah, I guess he's working more like an industrial designer. It's pretty cool. He's like kind of need, I guess as a concept artist, you need to know like a little bit about architecture and a little bit about like product design and uh, even like religion, politics, like all that stuff goes uh, goes into what produces the the environment or the concept. So I don't know these rocks, or the, these uh, crystals, I think they're too big overall. Craig is the, <laughs> the whatever comes next. So maybe if these are just shorter. Let me turn off this update for a second. Um, I'm going to turn these resolution stuff down. I think right now the big one of the bigger issues is we just don't have something to give it scale. Like usually the the concepts people put like a person in there or a, a boat or like something that you can tell what uh, what scale things are at. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's essential, a banana for scale. <laughs> I don't think it's, uh, you don't always need it, but it can be nice. Like, even if you have a little person right here or a silhouette or something, like, just uh, whoever's looking at it can automatically know what uh, what your intention was. Um, but yeah, I don't know. These little things aren't showing up that well. Maybe I made them too, too small. Randomized height. Yeah, I think I'm trying to I'm trying to see what went wrong here. Might turn this stuff off to make it. Uh, just quicker to, to work with. Oof. We'll just try the P scale randomization. Put in some animated bats in a crowd sim. Then we have the bat cave. <laughs> All right, so I just did a random ramp for the P scale. I might just do the mountain up here. So I think some of them were getting made, made like flattened or reversed if we did it at the end. COVID cave. <laughs> See what happens with some more. <laughs> Everyone's welcome. Some fake caustics going. Yeah, that'd be cool. Like some bounce, something happening. Um, I might do right here is maybe um, 
try to distribute these based off of I don't know if we could do it by curvature. I think we need to convert out of polysoups to get it to work. I feel like these are getting too, um, I don't know, maybe you wouldn't see the crystals or whatever these are on the uh, corners or like the tips of the rocks. So this, is making the curvature attribute. Um, and if you just Oof. I was going to try blurring. Might just be that I don't I, I don't know where that value is right now. Let's see. Oh maybe it's um I think I need to promote it to a point attribute. You still work with feature films? I haven't that recently. Um, I've been doing more like advertising or tech stuff in this area, just because it's the way that uh, Northern California has has adjusted or whatever. Like in the last four four years. Um, but yeah, it's also feature films are also can be a bit more slower paced, like. <clears throat> you might be spending a year on a, a sequence or an effect or something like that, depending on it. I, I think I prefer advertising um, a little bit more, even this kind of stuff, just because it's more fast paced or you're, you're switching what you're working on more often. Yeah, the ad, ad stuff is a pretty interesting zone because it's like one month projects maybe like it could depend on budgets and stuff like that but it seems like <clears throat> let me just try to see what's going on with this We're going from curvature yeah i think i don't know like if you're just starting out as especially two ads can be really good for your um For your demo reel and stuff because you're you're able to make so many projects so quickly and build up like a body of different r d different effects and stuff like that but if you start and the first thing you work on is um like a movie you might just have a bunch of like background dust simulations or <laughs> debris especially if you're a junior artist that that may be what they put you on and then a year later all that you have is uh is uh just a bunch of like little elements all cool jobs and companies yeah I, I don't know i mean a lot of it's moved i think right now vancouver or london has a lot of uh film stuff going on i don't know what's happening with my uh visualizer stuff uh somehow this I didn't put that there. What the hell is going on? I don't know what happened. It's a mystery. Is that, um, yeah, so yeah, the, according to the webcam, it's kind of to one side. So I have two monitors. Um, the, the one way that I work on is, I guess I should flip like these panes around or something. 
but it's also just my desk set up and stuff like that. I, I don't have uh, the ability to to move stuff that easily. I think the monitors I ended up buying were too big, so I've just put up with them this way. Chris Arn, how's it going? Found the original yacht design sound fine signed by Sid. Yeah, that's super cool. Just to have uh, any original works from him is is a super cool thing to to hold on to. So I'm just trying to isolate. I don't know if they go negative. I guess they're just pretty low numbers here. So I'm trying to isolate this curvature range for uh, where the crystal stuff might go. Maybe we flip it around. We would try to just keep it off of the corners or edges with this. Can a monitor get too big? <laughs> If you have two of them and they're in the same space, like I have them on adjust adjusting arms and stuff, so it's can be. T if you get too close to them, they're too big. All right, so let's just do this wrangle. I'm just gonna make a density attribute from the color. And then I usually just delete the color. Otherwise it would like keep going onto the instances, I think. Yeah, if you're too close to it, but it's also, um, it's also a bit weird because like so many of the 3D applications will have text that's small and like setting up scaling sometimes is a pain. So it's, it's kind of weird, I guess, with. CG stuff, maybe you want like one that's super big and the other one normal sized or something. I don't know, like, it somehow got mad at me about these normals or something. Um, how could this be? It was working before. There it is. So yeah, I, I just wasted a lot of time trying to get the distribution of these crystals to look better. I don't know if it helped or not. Um, we could try this blur again and see. Looks like it doesn't change. I don't know, I'm, I'm gonna give up spending too much time on that for right now. Um, so maybe with this randomize, I feel like nothing is updating. I don't know why that wasn't uh, updating before. Let's try it like this. Yeah, I don't know these, uh, I just be, have to give up on these.
Yeah, that's kind of what I was trying to do with the um, curvature stuff, but I, I think it, I just couldn't ramp it properly. Um, maybe instead of this, I'll just try doing it from a noise. I feel like the uh, scatter algorithm sometimes can be hard to set up with noises. hell is going on? God damn it. All right, I'm just gonna do it with color. It might just be my, my threshold and stuff is like, out of whack. I think something, somehow my Houdini session got cursed or something. <laughs> Don't say that. No, but it, it's a, uh, you try moving this, I guess it works. So, which the viewport bug, uh, I, I, I've had it happen less and less, but I think it does sometimes still happen. It looks like my noise range or something was just messed up though. So, um, I think I can use the low value or the white area to, to scatter these things around. Um, let's try something like this. It would be cool. Maybe even less. I did see that the one guy, uh, the, one of the game dev guys added that to the um, drop down menu of the, the tools, where it's like reset Houdini's viewport or something. <laughs> so it's, uh, that must definitely still be uh, happening to some people with, with some circumstances. But yeah, I think this is a, a bit better, having them just concentrated in, in certain areas. It's a good compositional tip from Steve. Um, yeah, I don't know. I might just leave them like that for right now. And uh, go back into the cave stuff for a little bit. I don't know if this... Gonna go with less saturation.
You want to see what happens with the photons? <laughs> I don't have the uptime command working. Sorry, Mr. It's Terrific. Um, yeah, so I think we could do this. Um, We need more of that. Um, yeah, sorry, but my bot in the Discord server might not be working. I'm not 100% sure. So we're going to have to do this with a bucket render. Um, so I'm just going to change the noise settings. Just go a bit higher with that. Way too bright. Some of this stuff right here might be caustic photons already. I'll do a I'll do a uh, non caustic one after this to see the difference. Let me get some water while this is going. I'll be right back. You think the caustic uh, stuff is affecting the god rays? Might be making that stuff even brighter as well. Let's take a look at this. Do you tend to use comp when you do professional work? I'm not sure what you mean by comp, like uh, a compositing application, or an actual compositor. Yeah, it depends on the on the work and stuff that I'm doing. Um, for if I was doing this type of stuff, like the fast paced, um, if you're working at a concept place or for advertising or stuff like that. Generally, not. But for bigger projects, um, I will, I'll usually use comp, especially with like. Because once you start working with other people, it, with Nuke, it becomes easier to like pull in other all the elements and combine them into one final image and stuff like that. Um, pretty much every advertising and and film project I worked on is Nuke with people to uh, to do that. Sometimes there's a, a flame artist or someone finishing with um, 
an additional <laughs> compositing program. But yeah, it's, I think Nuke is pretty much the standard for, for me for professional. You think it didn't do anything? I don't know, it might have. Let me uh, make a copy of this. Um, I'll, I'll just do another render. Um, you know what it might have been? I might have forgotten to um, to set it. So I think with this, this box with redshift visibility, we need this one, right? Boo myself. <laughs> so let's go back to the redshift and uh, I'm gonna keep turning this error threshold up and then I'll do another one. So this is our, our original one was before caustics and then this one will be uh, with caustics and a lot more noise. It's a little bit different. Seems to be doing a little bit. But I might go in. Um, I might go in and adjust. You still think they aren't on? Um, I think it might just be that the, that I have so few that it's not doing that much of a pre-processing step. Um, so like this, I'll usually turn it up that high or something. Um, but then on that out, this I think is a super low number. I don't know why these sliders are such a weird range. Um, and then I think with my scene scale, like probably want these search radius. I'm working kind of inside like a unit box. Um, We'll see if it did it. It's, it was quick again. I saw it pop up somewhere. It said uh, some stuff. We could try doing um, the intensity to really see what happens. But I think Probably want the crystals to, to get involved with the caustics as well. We really want to add some interest to things. Um, I think right now I have a feeling it's just that little areas. Um, we could try it sometimes just go up to 100. Just see what just to make sure it's working, I guess. I don't know, are the crystals? I guess, maybe that's just a stray photon point that landed there or something.
But it does look like it's working. I think it does help. Um, what I might do is just set it to five and uh, see what happens. This is definitely doing something. This area here, it should be um, helping out quite a bit. I think it helps to add like some kind of rim rim lights, some edges and stuff like that. So I might play around with this light source a little bit um, after this render finishes up and try to uh, See if I can get a better, it's, I think it's hitting everything pretty nicely, but um, I don't know if there's a better angle or something we could get. I think we might want those crystals smaller. It's like, uh, Something like that. And then we could add more. Yeah, so I'm just going to save this and play around with the uh, light. I don't know if with the spotlight settings. Um, making it more focused. Oops, forgot to uh, have it pinned. Might, might just be too, too uh, high of an exposure right now.
I think it was pretty nice how it was cutting in before. See what's going on with the uh, this stuff. Try something without. I think the scattering might be a little too uh, intense right now. I think the uh, something funky is going on with this water stuff. It's like too. Uh, <laughs> it's glowing again. Somehow this might be this coefficient. It's just too too saturated before. kind of green stuff might be a little more natural. Um, and then just overall this tint, too heavy. So yeah, this might be pretty, pretty nice for right now. Um, I'm gonna stop that render um i'm gonna go back to the box and <clears throat> um what i might do is just run the main noise stuff at a higher voxel size uh, more voxels uh, to just to eke out a little bit more detail um within the cave area we'll fire off another Render with the, the higher settings, take a look. That'll probably be it for today. Maybe it would have been better to go with plants instead of, uh, I think that's what's nice about Cinema 4D. They have the plugin or whatever with like the library I think it's just for Octane, maybe. But they have uh, their own library that they just click and drag and drop plants and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's moved pretty cool. Um, I think right, the colors, some nice vibes right now. Um, we're starting to get some, some interesting, like, I think what Alex said with doing the cool and warm stuff is is uh, was a good idea with the the light. So it looked like the, our node, our volume is done cooking. <laughs> um, it might have eked out a little bit more detail. Sometimes you have to turn down the adaptivity just to make sure you see all of the. Oh no, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Happens to the best. 
Yeah, I don't know why that's a weird thing for it to crash right there. Because I, I don't think I was running Redshift, and uh, usually the VDB, like with VDB, it, it will either fill up your memory or it will just maybe it was filling up the memory. Um, but yeah, let's lower that adaptivity maybe. Sometimes just Redshift. I feel like just using Redshift with the IPR and stuff, it does add like slight increase in probability to uh, the chance that it will crash. It's like a voodoo. But yeah, I feel like maybe the green this kind of stuff is pretty cool. Some, some uh, flora. But yeah, it'd be cool if side effects had some tools that would, uh, that would, um, you could just like drag and drop or get trees going pretty quickly. Look at that beam. There's those caustics, right? I don't know if my, um, might be like, oh no, <laughs> the hell is going on? Doesn't make sense why it would be, uh, the only thing I change is that adaptivity. That beam looks dangerous. It's uh... Yeah, I guess maybe go just go up to 0 0.05 back. Um, put it back in the folder. Test some of the Quixel Mega Scans and their scatter tool is really nice. Now that, yeah, I was, this morning I was logging into uh, the Quixel stuff with my um, Unreal login. Do you need an Unreal subscription or something though? Because it seemed like it was saying like something about a 30 day trial. But I was going to mess around with it for the 30 days at least and see what happened. You guys want to see this? You think it's free. <laughs> I, was trying, I was trying to do like a cloth uh, kind of thing. All assets are free within Unreal Engine. So in other DCCs, you, uh, you have to pay the bridge. Something, something about it wasn't happy. Ye oh, you can download it as an FBX. Is it? But after your trial ends, it won't. Uh, I need to investigate their terms. All right, we're we're gonna fix it this time. So. The hell um i'm just gonna open that one and uh i'm gonna go less um I'm just gonna try it really low and see what happens
So that works. I don't know if we're gonna try it. At... This one works. And I'm just gonna go to 600. I guess at a certain point, maybe it was just too much memory for the VDB stuff to handle. My computer, my RAM might be uh, too low as well. I don't know. Yeah, so I was linking my Epic account to it uh, earlier this morning. I, I was able to log in, um, but yeah, I'll try the bridge stuff. You're just technically meant to use it for Unreal Engine. All right, so this is working now. Um, we could try it. I think this. Let's try it going down with the adaptivity. You need logins, one for Houdini, one for Unreal. Do you need you need two logins for for uh, for uh, Quixel? What do they have to do with Houdini? You probably should just everything should be through the uh, the Epic account, right? All right. So this this will just be the higher quality settings. Um, oh, you just mean in general to work? You need your Houdini Indie license. <laughs> you need everything needs a license. The worst is Photoshop. It's like you're paying twenty dollars a month just to. Paint on a picture. <laughs> is the whole cave made inside Houdini? With this one, yeah, it was just through the, the procedural noises and stuff like that, Eckhart. Um, so I'm doing volume based. Uh, let me just get the thing going. Just volume based noise, like 3D noise with the volume um, to get the general form. Yeah, I was just messing around with with uh, abstract stuff for today. I guess this this one is one that's less abstract, but um, did it go? Um, but yeah, it's, it seems like a pretty good, pretty good exercise. My, some of my lighting and stuff is a little odd. I saw the one he did that was like the two triangles pushing against the spheres. It was really cool. All right. You, you directed me to the Swedish Instagram. <laughs> this still makes you view it. I'll just switch this over to my uh, Chrome. I don't know, Instagram made you sign in to uh, the view stuff. Ooh. What is it coming out of? This is like, <laughs> someone's giving birth. This is a pretty cool, um, I, I like the ca camera work for it quite a bit to do the 360 degree looping stuff. This one, uh, I like this one better. Just the details and stuff in the crunching. Really cool. This is like the one guy, um, Eric Ferguson. You look up some of the the like soft body stuff he does 
It's, I, I don't think I can even show it on Twitch. It's, it might be TOS. But the Eric Ferguson guy, if you look him up, he does a lot of FEM stuff. This is gross, yes. <laughs> that, the last one that Adam Swab did, or the most recent one, kind of reminds me of that a little bit. But yeah, this is... Uh, Can you look at question above if you have a second? Um, I didn't, see, oh, from what I understood, it is possible to set the top network in a way to offload distribute various calculations, not talking about rendering between machines. If this is correct and yes, how ridiculously difficult is it to set up? Um, yeah, it's supposed to be set up that way. I don't know which, which areas and stuff you would wanna set it up in that fashion. Um, I'm just going to go to a high quality render. So, um, I think it has to do like you would have to be working and set up where you're making the task items in your, in your scene graph. Um, so it's not, it's not, it's not necessarily just like a one switch where all of a sudden your like VDB calculations and everything are using like the brain power of the entire farm or machines. Um, but if you're saving out like multi-frame geometry, then it can automatically start lighting up other machines and stuff like that. Um, if you ever use tops, you see the little lights that go up for the different work items. Like it would be those that would be distributed to other machines. Um, I don't, I don't know enough about it to, to demo it or to set it up that way or whatever. Um, but I have the HQ stuff, so I should be able to use this as a scheduler and have the other, um, I have like one other desktop that's going with it. Um, but in general, it depends a lot on what you're, what type of stuff you're working on. So like I said, it's not necessarily a one thing switch over, but for, um, like for this volume noise stuff, I don't think it, like you can't really segment out that to different um, machines that easily. For simulations, it's a bit harder, but for, it is possible. Um, yeah, so they, you'd need to use these schedulers. They have an HQ scheduler and then they have a deadline, what? deadline scheduler built in. Um, and then these let you use multiple machines. So you have your local scheduler, that's just your workstation. And then using either HQ or deadline. Um, I don't know if they have, so yeah, if you really know a lot, then you could do, um, maybe the Python scheduler, but that's probably too <laughs> very ridiculously difficult to set up. But yeah, I think. The HQ one is probably the easiest to set up just because Houdini develops HQ as well as, um, as well as, uh, Houdini itself. So they're in control of everything. The deadline one, I remember trying to set it up at one of the places I was working, but like with the IT department and stuff like that, it was just a bit more difficult. Um, cause they, they were setting like permissions and variables and stuff and it was causing some issues. But yeah, that should be good to, good to go that way. Um, some of the stuff it, it's easier to set up for, like the distributed flip. I think that they have that um, stuff set up across other machines, like the sparse, certain things like the sparse pyro. It could be really nice to, to get going if you were doing like a forest fire. That would be like a really good thing to test it out on where you could different computers could do different portions of your forest or something like that. I don't know what happened here. Maybe it's my, uh, my bump noise is a little odd or something. Certain, certain parts of this are working better than others.
Eric will forever give you nightmares. I haven't seen any new stuff from him recently. Does he have new stuff on there or he's taking a break? I think he was also working as a like traditional effects artist or something. Can't watch anymore. <laughs> This one's okay to show. I don't know. This might be t <laughs> this might be TOS. <laughs> but yeah, I feel like he he might be a character artist or something like that, like a creature. Um, see, that doesn't bother me at all. It's just cool. Yeah, I think for me, it doesn't. It's, it doesn't really haunt me too much, but I can see it being uh, an issue. <laughs> but yeah, this some some areas here are working pretty well, I think. But um, I don't know if it's my lighting. I need to control it a little bit more, or something like that. Some certain. Certain aspects of this image seem a little bit off. But yeah, we're probably going to keep this bucket going. And then uh, after it finishes rendering, we'll call, it, call this a, fr a Friday. Call it a cool zone. I need to to read up more on my composition techniques. But yeah, I think in general doing uh, plants would have been would be better than these crystals, especially like hanging ivy or something like that. Because I feel like it's easier with plants to give you a better sense of scale. Because like looking at the leaf, that automatically tells people how big things get. And then I don't know, maybe um, putting in some some fill lights or basically like using some some area lights to do uh, to replicate the caustic stuff. Because I have it turned on right now um, with with uh, the photons. I think I left it at five. <laughs> We're used to. It. It's like it's kind of like Cronenberg. You ever watch his movies? He's always got some some things like that happening. Um, but yeah, I think this it left it at five, so it's definitely doing something. Um, but I feel like compositionally, if you, you really want to like paint in caustics hit in a certain area or something, this is the way to go. I think from the broad uh, thumbnail, though, this is a pretty interesting idea for a composition. 
they have this strong like diagonal going across the image the majority of this stuff kind of light and then this uh this area more more in shadow is pretty interesting result it's popped in your recommended Life Beyond 2. Oh, wow. This is nice plants. These are mega scans. Ooh. Ooh, he did good good crystals there. I think the water shader is a little bit better. It's kind of just like a blurry mirror he ended up doing. foreground should have darker values yeah i was playing around with some of that stuff um i think in general this like maybe doing a backdrop or something but like maybe this stuff here is too bright um like i think the brightest area should be that the opening of the cave i guess to have your eye more directed there but yeah it's hard to uh so I was basically doing the exposure stuff to try to have the, more of the foreground dim. A new Daku. <laughs> How's it going? We're, we're just wrapping up here pretty much. There's, a, there's some really cool shots in this one. Wanna become famous? Get the, it's time to yeet. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> um, yeah, but there's some really nice, this ending stuff is really cool. You missed so much. <laughs> it's okay. I mean, yeah, it was just, we just uh, built up this thing pretty much um we're doing volume noises and uh then some stuff in the shader to get like the little bump mapping and, and stuff like that um so it was just a day daily kind of uh draft or sketch or something like that but yeah it's, it's in the vod and then i'll usually upload those to youtube as well um just to for, for people to to view Yeah, I think this frame right here is my favorite. The crystals work is pretty cool as well. But yeah, it seems like there is some some other rocks, like little instances or something he added that, that helps as well there. But yeah, we ended up with a pretty cool thing. Um, cool, more cool results from the cool zone. Um, so yeah, the schedule, uh, tomorrow we'll be doing more of the tire burnout, maybe perfecting it, maybe <laughs> getting closer. Um, and then Sunday is the Vex, we'll be doing the packed primitive, uh, destruction or fracturing, or, uh, just some interesting effects, uh, writing Vex to modify the, uh, packed primitive transforms. Yeah, thanks everyone for contributing, hanging out, watching, lurking. <laughs> got some some good tips and stuff like that. We ended, we got another pretty cool uh, result for for all this stuff. Hope hope everyone enjoys the rest of their Friday, the night, or start of the weekend. Take it easy.